Um, but this week we want to uh, carry on a little bit from our uh, session last week. Can we turn this down just a touch, Alex? Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to deafen everyone. Um, but uh, I want to carry on with our Covenant Relationships uh, series that we're doing. We started last week with Covenant Relationships Part 1. Um, so this week, just to shake it up a little bit, we're going to do Part 2. Because that's the way things tend to work. I thought about doing part three, but then I thought that might not make much sense. Um, so we're going to do part two this morning. Um, but I wanted to just sort of recap a little bit of what we did last week. And we looked at the, the covenant relationship and three things that God promises us when he makes a covenant with us. These three things being firstly that when he makes a, a covenant with us, it provides power. Secondly, it provides protection. And thirdly, it provides purpose. And we did them in a different order last week. But they're the same three things. Those three things are so vital to any covenant that God makes with his people. When God makes a promise, a covenant with his people, these are three things that he promises to them. And we said that when we step into that covenant, our lives should look different to the people around us because we live under the protection of God with his purpose and his power and that makes us stand out from the people around us we looked at the story of Noah and how when he was building that boat he must have looked like a bit of a fool until the day that it was needed and for some people in here you're doing the things that God's called you to and you look like a bit of a fool until the day that that thing comes to pass and all of a sudden everyone sees why you were doing what you were doing and now everyone sees God at work in you and so we looked at these three things that God promises to people who are in covenant relationship with him. But I want to look at what our responsibility is in stepping into covenant with him today. And so if you've got a Bible, turn to Philippians. We're going to do a little bit of dancing around today. Yeah. Mainly through the Bible and not on the stage. But if I get excited, I might do a little bit of dancing on the stage. So I love the book of Philippians because it's... If nothing else, it really sums up what we've been singing this morning. Um, it really kind of echoes the songs that we've been singing about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. And the reason that I, I think that is because for anyone who doesn't know, the book of Philippians was written by a guy called Paul. If you haven't heard of Paul, he wrote most of the New Testament. Um, quite an important dude, really. Um, but <laughs> this guy wrote the book of Philippians, and he wasn't sat in some cush sort of library or some really nice office upstairs in his little house writing away and sort of thinking this is a really nice letter when Paul wrote this letter he was stuck away in the corner of a prison with absolutely nothing and yet I love the way that he starts this letter and I want to start from the start of chapter 1 and then we're going to do a bit of jumping around through the book of Philippians but in chapter 1 and verse 1 it says this Paul and Timothy bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ the very first thing I want to look at is that word bond servant. If you saw it in verse 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. Now this is such an important word that echoes the lifestyle that Paul has chosen to live because it's not a lifestyle of I'll live with God sometimes. If it feels right, I'll do what God's called me to. This word bond servant means so much more. And I think one of the best definitions of bond servant that we get is in the book of Ruth. So I said we'd do a little bit of jumping around. Uh, we're going to just quickly flip to the book of Ruth because I can read it much better than I can explain it. Someone stole Ruth out of my Bible. If anyone stole it, could you give it back? And in Ruth chapter 1, it says this. For anyone who, uh, who doesn't know what Ruth's about, Ruth um, lost her, her husband and decided to pledge herself to her mother-in-law. And this is what she says in verse 16. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from you, turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. You see, in this verse is here, Ruth makes a covenant with Naomi and says, this is now how I will live my life, fully devoted to everything that you're doing. Your God will be my God, your people will be my people. No longer will I think of myself, but I will put you before me 
in every situation and focus solely on serving you and doing everything that you need me to do. That's the Michael's Amplified version. And it's very similar to a verse that we read in Corinthians that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17 where he says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What happens is when we dedicate ourselves to Christ, when we say, I'm entering into a covenant relationship with God, we do away with all of ourself and put God at the centre of what he's doing. I love the verse in Galatians chapter 2 where it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. No longer do I live focused on my life and what I can achieve, but I live fully focused on the Christ who lives on the inside of me. I've done away with everything of me, and I'm focusing on God. And if I were to give a title to this message beyond Covenant Relationships Part 2, it would be In the Palace and the Prison. Because what I want to do is, if we jump back to Philippians, and we're going to carry on reading from verse 3 of Philippians chapter 1. And Paul says this, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until, hang on, let's read that bit again. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. Verse 8 says, For God is my witness, how greatly... My Bible's changing pages for me. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of, of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And this is a part that I want to look at. In verse 12 it says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ, And most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear. There's a verse earlier in that chapter that says, I'm confident that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. And then he goes on to say in that verse, in verse 13, that it's become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are are in Christ and it's caused confidence for those around to speak the gospel one of the things that Jane said earlier on at the end of worship was she said that it's really easy to praise God on the mountaintops but it's much more difficult to praise him in the valleys it takes something within you to stir something up on the inside and say God I'm going to praise you regardless of the situation for me Paul is the evidence of this in this chapter here where he says that it has become evident to the whole palace now bearing in mind he's not in the palace He's in the prison. He isn't standing in the forecourt of the palace and preaching to those who are coming past. He's sat in the prison preaching to the prison guards, preaching to anyone that he can find. I would love to think that if Paul couldn't preach to anyone else, he preached to the stones just so that the entire palace itself would cry out the love of God. But what happens is as Paul begins to praise God, even in the very depths of the prison, Something begins to change. It makes a difference in the hearts of the people that are around him. And the whole palace begins to hear of the goodness of God. For some of you, it may feel like you're stuck in the darkest part of the prison. But the question I have is, is the palace around you hearing of the goodness of God while you're in the prison? 
Because you can be in the lowest of the lows, but when you praise God in that situation, it becomes evident to everyone around you that there's something different in your life. Because when you set yourself aside as a bondservant to God, as someone who says, I'm dedicating my entire life to serving God in any way that I can, that my God, your God will be my God, your people will be my people, in every way that I do, I'm living to serve you. When we make that commitment, then it's in those valleys that it proves that. That's the proving ground for the commitment that we make. And so many of us hit the valleys, hit the prison, the darkest place, and it makes or breaks us in that place. You can hit rock bottom and build up, or you can hit rock bottom and say, this is where I'm staying. But if you're not willing to praise God in the prison, the palace will never hear. If you're not willing to give God the glory, even in the darkest of situations, the people around you will never see the difference because it's easy for anyone to be thankful when things are good. It's easy for anyone to be thankful when everything's going the right way. But what makes you stand out is when you say, I'm going to be thankful regardless of whatever's going on. I'm going to praise God in every situation. And Paul carries on writing in Philippians chapter 4. And he says this, in verse 6 he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, and whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, and whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue... And if, the, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Paul here gives us an instruction for how to act when we're in the lowest of the low. He says that regardless of the situation, regardless of what's going on, be anxious for nothing. At first glance, you would say, Paul, that's much easier to write than it is to actually do. I think many of us could turn around and say, that's very well saying, be anxious for nothing. But have you seen the mountain of debt that I've got over here? Have you seen the problem that I'm facing over here? Have you seen the people that are standing behind me ready to kill me the first chance they get? The reason I don't think we can say that to Paul is because if any man has lived that, it was Paul, because Paul suffered every imaginable thing possible for the gospel, and yet still was able to write, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with much prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. In other words, don't sit there and moan and groan and grumble because things aren't going right, but instead do something about it. Instead of saying, I'm sitting here, I've had enough, Turn to God and say, God, I'm thanking you for the way that you're going to bring me through this. I thank you for the way that you're going to deliver me from the situation that I'm in. Reminding myself of that verse in chapter 1, that he who is faithful to begin a work, he who began a good work in you, is faithful to complete it. Paul carries on to say this. He says in verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learnt whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be a bast and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learnt both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then this famous verse that many of us will know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Paul here is writing to the Philippians who have been charitable contributors to his cause. They've sown into his cause when no one else was. 
They've been faithful in serving him. And now Paul writes from his position that seems hopeless and says, even in this situation, God will be faithful to serve you. Thank you, Gracia Star. He says that whatever the situation, whatever circumstance you're going through, it's not about need, it's not about the things that you've got. Because he says that I've learned to be plentiful and I've learned to have nothing. I've learned to abound in all things and learned to, to suffer with the little that I have. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, it's not about the situation you're in. It's about the circumstance of your heart and not the circumstance that surrounds you. It's about what position you choose to put your heart in as to whether you'll come through the things that you're going through. Because he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me regardless of of how much money I have, regardless of my health, regardless of my finances. Whatever's going on, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Knowing this, that he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. If we don't remember this, if we don't bring this back to our mind, that whatever God started in us, he will be faithful to complete it. One of the stories that I love through the Bible is you read through the Old Testament, you see there are times where the, the Israelite people, God's chosen people, were taken into captivity in Babylon, taken away from Jerusalem, from their promised land, and the, the land was left in ruins. And then as God begins to restore the nation of Israel, people are released from captivity and sent back to Jerusalem, and they begin to rebuild the temple. And as they build the temple, they see the walls go up and they put the temple back together. But as they begin to work, build the walls around the city to fortify the city, the enemy comes in, sees what they're doing and says, we've got to put a stop to this. And so writes to the king who has just released them and says, do you know what they're doing? They're plotting against you. They're going to try and cause a revolt. You need to stop them. And so the king puts a stop to everything that they're doing. And for years and years after that, they have this temple that has been built, but no walls around the city. And this is where we hit the story of Nehemiah. For anyone who's read the book of Nehemiah, this is the point where Nehemiah kicks in. Because now some people come back from the city of Jerusalem to Nehemiah, and Nehemiah asks them and says, how are the things in Jerusalem? And they say that the walls are in tatters. And we've basically become the laughing stock of all the nations around us. Because we have a temple that's built, but nothing to surround us, nothing to protect us. And Nehemiah's heart's broken, and he knows that if God had promised restoration to Israel, then something needed to be done about it. You see, there was a massive gap in time between when the, the temple was finished and when Nehemiah comes and starts to build the wall again. And I think for many people, there was works that have been started that seem to have had a long, long gap where nothing's happened. And it's almost like you've become a bit of a laughing stock to people around you because you were so enthusiastic when you started. You were so sure that this is what God was calling you to. But something changed. Something came against you. Something stopped. And all of a sudden it wasn't possible to keep going in what you felt God was calling you to. And now you just look like the idiot who built a boat when there was no rain. Now you just look like the idiot who sat there trying to do something that no one else seems to be able to understand. But God who began a good work is faithful to complete those things which he said. And so even though it seems like nothing's happened for a long time, when God says now is the moment, this is the time where something is going to change, something is going to start again, the Nehemiah of your life is going to come along and speak some life back into the situation. All of a sudden that thing which has sat for years in ruins in 52 days was rebuilt and restored. But the thing that I love about the story of Nehemiah is Nehemiah goes with the king's blessing but he doesn't rock up with tons and tons of stone and some really nice marble arches. And some fancy things to get the people sparked up. He turns up with a bit of wood. 
for the gateposts. And then he goes around and assesses everything that's going on. And when he looks around, he sees all the rubble that's left. And he rebuilds the walls with the broken pieces that were knocked down. There are broken pieces in your life that might look like rubble, that might look like they're of no use anymore. But those are the things that God is going to build. The thing that he's promised. Because God doesn't need to start afresh with you. God doesn't need to clear everything out of the way. God started a work and he will finish that thing which he started. And one of the things that you find in the book of Nehemiah is as he begins to build the wall, this guy called Samballat, who's the, the guy who's completely opposed to everything happening, turns around and says, look at these fools. They're trying to rebuild the wall. And he sees how quickly they're doing it. And he says, huh, will they rebuild it in a day? Something that's been sat there for years and years doing nothing. And because all of a sudden it's starting to move, he begins to mock them and say, look, you think you can get it done so quick, there's no chance you're going to be able to do it. And then he turns around and says, they're even using stones that have been burnt. Now, I'm not a geologist, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But my understanding is that when you burn a stone, not an awful lot happens to it. It might get a little bit black. It might not look the prettiest anymore. But generally, a stone is still a stone once it's been burnt. You may look this morning like you've been burnt. You may have a few black singed edges around you. But you are still what God said you were in the beginning. You are still able to do the things that God said you were able to do. And you will finish the work that God called you to. Not because of who you are, but because of who Christ is in you. Because when you step into a covenant relationship with God, you step out of who am I to who is the I am in me. You see, when Moses was talking to God and God said, tell the people that I am who I am. God was saying, tell the people that I am everything that they need to fulfill what is needed. Every need that they have, I am the fulfillment of that. And God is saying the same to you. When you step into relationship with him and say, I am no longer living my life, but Christ who lives in me. Then God says, I am all that you need to do what God has called you to. You may feel like the walls around you have been knocked down. You may feel like everything is against you. But God wants to say this morning that I can rebuild with the stones that look a bit burnt. I can rebuild with whatever's there. I don't need to start fresh. I don't need to wipe everything away because I have everything I need to build. Nehemiah went around the walls and he assessed everything and once he'd looked at the things, he knew what needed to be done. And I feel it's almost like God this morning is going around and saying, I know what needs to be done. Are you ready to come with me? Are you ready to build the walls back up? Are you ready to complete the thing which I started?